we'll, um, we're still going through um, those subjects that are somewhat controversial and they have huge impact in our lives. These are not just simply controversial among theologians, the things that we go through, uh, whether uh, mental health, as we have uh, spoken, you know, spoken about it, and we had three sessions on the mental health, or um, what um, many scholars call it modified Sabbatarianism. Uh, we'll tell you about that in a minute, what this means. Or later on, we'll do other studies that have, uh, though they are con very controversial, but have huge impact in our lives, very relevant, um, courting, um, uh, what, what does that entail? And um, we have many parents that have young kids that in, in a matter of few years, they will find themselves knowing, wanting to know, well, well how do I do it right? What is a biblical model? Uh, so I want to talk to you, uh, brothers and sisters, and um, about this subject. And also I want to talk about teenage uh, parenting. Um, again, I want to resurrect that, and I spoke about it years ago, but I do want to share with you how I personally reformed my parenting and how you may too, and I want to share with you from the scripture the things that we have to watch out for in the post-COVID culture we live in, okay? Um, so they are controversial, but very relevant. Now, Sabbatarianism is something to do with which command? The fourth command. I, uh, I'm just going to have a, a very quick overview of what I spoke about last week. But I want to say to you, if you, have, if you weren't here and you don't know what this word means and you, you don't know where you stand, or uh, please, I, I urge you, uh, go ahead and download last week's message. It's the start of a, a, a good long journey that we're going to take step by step to understand this fourth command. Sadly, even among so many good churches, for whatever reason, I, I, I know the reason, I will share the reason with you later, not today. For, for a, a particular reason, it seems like it, that command is buried, buried under five kilometer depth of sand, never been spoken about. People don't want to talk about it. Uh, yes, they talk about honoring parents. They talk about adultery. They talk about a lot of stuff, but not the fourth command. And we want to know if it's written in the Bible, it has impact in our lives, especially if it's part of the Decalogue, part of the Ten Commandments. So we need to know. Is it binding or is it not? And if it is binding, how far, how much is it binding? Or, or if it's not, then that's good. Let's just move on. <laughs> but you know my view, it is binding. But before we launch into it, I want to take you step by step. All right? I want to take you step by step because I honor and I respect, and I know there are many of you honor and respect those people who turn their eyes to totally away, 180 degrees from this command. Due to that, I want to take my time with you. And over time, we will learn a lot of other stuff, which are really great to, uh, and of great benefit. So last week, the first step that we took, what was it about? What was it that we spoke about last week? Three parts of the law. Excellent. At least one person knows how to read. <laughs> three parts of the law. And what are the three parts of the law? Okay. Mike will be handy. Put your hand up. It'll be good. What are the three parts of the law? If you can tell us what they are, and flesh him out a little bit, that will be good. So moral law, civil law, and ceremonial law. Yep. Moral is what continues to this day um, to do with basically Christian living and 
principles and, and these types of things. Civil law is more to do with laws of the land, justice, um, that kind of thing. Mm. And ceremonial was more to do with the, the rituals and the traditions um, back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Good. Paul, did you want to mention something else? Yeah. All right. Three parts of the law, three divisions, all right? Moral law, civil law, ceremonial law, right? Now, those who subscribe to those three divisions, Vody Bokum, Asi Sproul, um, Big Guns, even John MacArthur's Study Bible, subscribe to it. When they subscribe to it, those who subscribe to it, okay, what do they say? What is in effect and what is not in effect? Which one ought to be binding and which ones are not binding? The moral law is binding. Everything else is not, okay? Now, even though that is the case, there are other people who we respect highly who reject these divisions. So we have gone through the scripture last week many parts of the scripture in fact this is what we have gone through to prove that it is biblical to break them down into those components all right we looked at the universal nature long before even the law was given what you find is people are held accountable to the moral law that was to come later. Um, the flood, people failed to uphold the moral law. Cain and Abel, what did Cain do? That's a violation of one of God's moral laws, right? Right? And on and on and on. So universal nature, way before the law was given, God held people accountable to the law that is yet to come. The moral law, not the civil law, not the ceremonial law, his moral law. Okay? Now, what does this word mean? Pentateuch. What does that mean? Can we just nicely ask the children to be quiet? I'm not saying they shouldn't play, but just a little bit quieter. It is the first five books in the Bible. All right? And we looked at some examples that God clearly distinguishes between one law that is binding to his own people, Israelites, and other laws that are binding to everyone, right? We looked at the prophets and the writings. And how did that division show itself in, 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 in this section of the Bible? How? It's everywhere, by the way, and I'm going to show you here the reference. Oops. So many references. We're not going to look at them. It's just a review. Remember, for example, Samuel, what did he say to Saul? What is better than the other? Obedience better than sacrifice. Both are laws by God, but one is better than the other. Right? And then we looked at the Gospels. Even Jesus reaffirmed this. Right? And one of the things that Jesus said to clearly show that there are distinctions between moral and ceremonial. What did he say? Remember when he said, you guys, when he was rebuking the Pharisees and that, and he was saying, you guys take care of making sure that you, you do your tithing, you know, the kemen and, and all the rest of it, the ceremonial thing, you know. And then he says, and you neglect 
the what? The weightier matter. There is a law and there are weightier matter of the law, provisions of the law. Okay? There are distinctions, even according to Jesus. In fact, you find Jesus at one stage saying, hey, hey you know that temple? Don't worry about it. Everybody's going to worship God everywhere. Don't worry about the temple to the Samaritan woman. And yet, at the same time, he says, ah, not a tittle. I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. I'm not going to abolish it. What do you mean? Are we going to abolish it? Is the law abolished or is it not? Well, one of them is ceremonial and the other is moral. And then Paul picks that up and carries it over. And then he says, uh, do we nullify the law? No. But what do we do? We establish the law. What? What do you mean you're not nullifying the law? I thought we don't need to cut lambs and you know slaughter lambs and we don't need to do a lot of ceremonial stuff. So what are you talking about? He says later on in Ephesians, we looked at it, that the death of Christ abolished the law. Did he abolish or did not? Well, it depends. You have to read in context, right? If he's talking about ceremonial law, you know it is abolished. If he's talking about the moral law, we know. It's been established. All right. Finally, today, number six. Number six, before we move on to another section. Again, I'm building up my case little by little to help us understand that, uh, that the fourth command is binding and we want to see how far it is binding and what does it mean and what are the implications for us as members of Saving Grace Bible Church or any Christian or even unbelievers for that matter, how far is it binding? Okay, so the last thing that I want to show you um, is number six, before we move into the next section, the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The moral law, according to the scripture, according to the Bible, I believe carry, gets carried over. There is a connection, if you like. Where do I get that from? Let me show you. Um, Look what God says about the new covenant. Ah, uh, by the way, um, hands up if you were not here last week and you never heard of those three divisions. Okay. You need to download the message. So I'm going through it really quick, but um, basically those opponents to this view, they say, uh, look, what we do is we scrape everything that is written in the Old Testament. Don't worry about it. It's only what is given to us in the New Testament we submit to. Anything the Old Testament says about the laws, we reject. That's what they say. And I had lots of discussions with them about this. It is absurd, given all those passages that we spoke about. And this is the final one that I want to show you before I look at something else even more specific. Look what God says about the new covenant. This is specifically directly about the new covenant. Look what he says. But this is the covenant. Which covenant? The new covenant, not the old covenant. This is the covenant which I will make. So that's Jeremiah. He's prophesying about the future covenant. I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. Then he says something interesting. He says, I will put what? My law within them and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. We know that this passage has been repeated over and over in the New Testament. 
But he, God says here, he will put what? My law. What is God's law that he said he will write in their hearts? Let me ask you even in a more... hermeneutically correct way. What did the first audience at Jeremiah's time, what did they understand of what this law means? How did they understand what this law is? If you had asked someone that Jeremiah wrote this book to, those Israelites back then, because they would have understood, they would have read this and understood my law means. How would they have understood this? What is my law? Would they, <clears throat> did God write his ceremonial law in our hearts in the new covenant? Of course not. That's absurd. Did God write the civil law? No. Well, what sort of, there's got to be some law they wrote. It is the moral law. There is a division between moral, um, civil, and ceremonial. And what God wrote in the new covenant, what God carried over into the new covenant is the moral law. Right? That's the only way you can understand this. More specifically, what this law is, I believe, all right, so now I have, I believe, having done what I did last week and this quick review with the addition of the six point, I have established my point that there is division between moral law of God that is universal, that never changes, right, and there's ceremonial and civil. And the second thing that has been established is that this moral law, since it is universal, guess what happens to the new covenant? It gets carried over. Doesn't change. Right? Doesn't get revoked. Gets carried over. But I'm going to be even more specific. <clears throat> because guess the summation, the summary of the moral law is. Well, that's good. That's, that's a total summation. That's, that's very good. But even that to be unpacked, I believe it's the Ten Commandments. When we talk about the law, the moral law, God brought those amazing laws that he gave all those commandments and he reduced them and summarized them into 10. Into 10 commandments. And that also can be referred to, the 10 commandments can be referred to and is referred to as the law. And when it's referred to as the law, it's actually referred to as the which type of law? Moral law. Okay, the Ten Commandments together is a summary of the moral law of God. How do we know this? Where do we get this from? Remember, does anybody want to have an answer to this, by the way? Where do we get that the Ten Commandments together is a summary of the moral law of God? Yes, Mela? Is that hands up? No? Ah, you're scratching your hand. Where do we get this? Anyone? Could it be true? Could it be? It could be false. But where do we get it from if it's true? Ah, praise God for the Bible. All right. Exodus, we'll talk about the Ten Commandments. Well, well, I'm assuming here that everybody knows what the Ten Commandments are, okay? I'm assuming I'm not talking to someone who's only just been born again. 
yesterday or two days ago off the street. Okay? We all, we all know here what the Ten Commandments are. Remember when a rich young man who came to Jesus and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do in order to inherit the kingdom of God? Right? What must I do? Well, we know he must be perfect if he would ever inherit the kingdom of God by his own merits. He must be perfect. So how did Jesus say to him, you've got to be perfect? You know the commandments. And then when he said, you know the commandments, what did he refer him to, this young rich ruler? The Ten Commandments. This is what he had in mind, the Ten Commandments. Two observations that we have to get from this so far up to this point, right? Number one, that the Ten Commandments is the summary of the moral law of God. But not only that, another observation. He says to him, you know the commandments, you know, you should know. Right? What, what does that mean? It's not a new teaching. You already know this. You know the Ten Commandments. You know what they're like. They're kind of the perfect summary of the moral law. Um, he even said, you know, yes, I, I, I have kept them since my youth. So he knows about the Ten Commandments. Now, those who reject this concept they say no 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 we don't follow the decalogue we don't follow the ten commandments we don't even follow the old testament moral law we follow a different law and that law that we follow is the law of love law of love the ten commandments are the summation of the law of love. <laughs> so we're not in dispute that we are ought to be following the law of love. But guess what? The law of love is, the, the, is directly connected to the Ten Commandments. Look what it says here in Romans 13, verse 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. Love, okay? Well, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. That's the moral law, right? Moral, our moral law in the New Testament is the law of love. Do we agree or not agree? We agree, right? And then he says, for this, for. What does that mean, for? He builds a connection. And he says, this supports that. Because of this, therefore, we have the law of love. And what is this that he appealed to in order to conclude we ought to follow the law of love? What does he appeal to? For this. All right? By the way, he doesn't say for these, but for this. It's a block. Right? For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, which is the rest of the Ten Commandments, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Because the Ten Commandments are summed up in you shall love your neighbor as as yourself, if you want to love, if you want to follow the law of love, what do you have to obey? The commandments. Love does not wrong, does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And what he refers to as the law, obviously, in the mind of Paul, is the Ten Commandments. Yes. In both examples, the reference is only for the second five commandments, which is the relationship between men. Yeah. However, keep the Sabbath is in the first five. Yeah. So this love one another. Yeah, that's the relationship between. Yes. Has he disputed and said, well, well obviously in that context of Romans 13, what is it about? 
It's about loving who? Yeah? Loving the brethren, right? You with me? Tracking with me? If you want to go there for. And we're going to pick up a few other things. If you want to love the brethren, which section of the Ten Commandments do you take? The second, right? Because remember what Jesus said uh, when, when he was asked, what is the great commandment? What did he do? How many, uh, how, how many commandments did he break it into? Loving God, vertical, and loving horizontal, right? And we know that that's the Ten Commandments broken that way. The first four is related to God. And the second six, the second, the, the, the last six related to people, right? So if I want to tell you, sum up for me, love for people, what would you refer me to? And if I would say to you, following the same logical flow, sum up for me, love for God, what would you refer to? The first four. He never violates this, right? We'll look into this even when we come later on and talk about it. In fact, let's just look at it now. So we'll go to Matthew. Let me get it for you. Matthew 26, 22 from 36 to 40. All right? Some scribe asking Jesus, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right? The second part, how do you break it? In the, uh, in the mind of that scribe, in the mind of the Jews, in the mind of those people that Jesus spoke to and his disciples all around him, how do you love your neighbor? No brainer, right? We just referred to, we, we said, so also by the same token, if that's the case, in the mind of the Jews and the scribe and the Pharisees and his own disciples, Jesus' disciples, when you want to flesh out the love for God, what would they say to you? Well, if loving your neighbor is the last six commandments, then they would have in their mind to love God is the first four. And no one would ever dispute that. No one. For thousands of years, no one would say, no, 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 no. The first command, yes. Yeah. Second command, yes. Yeah. Third command, yeah. But the fourth, no, 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 no. No one would ever dispute that, right? All right, let's move on. Again, we're looking at the, um, the Ten Commandments here. Represent the whole law. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Again, yes, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So, of course, he's going to common sense demands that he appeals to the first, last six. But you can see in the mind of people, even at the start of the church, the law, 
They go straight to the Ten Commandments. Nowhere in the scripture has it ever been split asunder. Always the law refers to this. Um, Here is another lengthy one, and that's, and I thought I bring this because um, Mark uh, asked me, uh, Mark, Mark Curious, Mark Sidham, asked me, uh, can we find out uh, that, that when, when Paul said about establishing the law, that he actually refers to the moral law? So look at this. <clears throat> The Ten Commandments are written in the heart of the Gentiles. Hmm. I don't know what that means. Do I have to... It's a bit slow. All right, we have to do the old-fashioned. So I don't know why it's it's not here. I've got it here in front of me. Maybe... Um, Romans 2, and we'll read from 14 to 23. Yeah? Yeah? Can you see it? Mm. All right. For when Gentiles who do not have the law... Now, what law? Do instinctively the things of the law. These not have the law, meaning they weren't given to them um, on on scrolls, for example, right? Um, They are a law to themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. What is it? The law that is written in their hearts. Okay? Their conscience. So it's not a new heart that we receive, of course. And we talk about the conscience here. Bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. On the day when according to my gospel, God will judge the secret of secrets of men through Christ Jesus. So basically it says that God will judge the Gentiles according to what? Law. What law? What law are we talking about here? If someone feels guilty that he has not killed an infidel, will God judge him guilty according to that law? Right? Because Muslim terrorists feel guilty. Man, I had an opportunity to blow up a building and I did not. And I feel guilty about that. God will judge me. Will God really judge him according to this? What law are we talking about? All right. Let's continue. But if you hear the name, uh, sorry, but if you bear the name Jew, so now we're talking about Jews, we're not talking about Gentiles now, and rely upon the law, and boast here, same thing. He didn't, he never redefined, he carries the same definition. Whatever Paul had in mind about the law that is written in the conscience of a Gentile, he carries that over, the same definition. And he speaks to the Jews. Now let's follow the train of thought. And know his will and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolishness, and on and on and on. So basically he's saying here, oh yeah, you agree with me, Mr. Uh, Netanyahu. You agree with me that God will judge those heathens, those Gentiles, judge him, judge him by what? By the law. What law? Well, still there. But you agree with me, Netanyahu, and you think, you claim that you are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. You therefore teach another. Do you not teach yourself? Teach what? You who preach the one, 
that one shall what? Not steal. Aha! Uh -huh. Now, Paul is beginning to flesh out what he has in mind about what that law is. Do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols. Wait a second. This is not now part of the, the last six commandments. Which commandment is this one? First two, right? Do you rob temples? So what law did he have in mind by which God will judge the Gentiles? Hasn't changed. You pick that definition and you bring it all the way up and you know what law he's talking about here. That's the law that is getting established. As you, as you read, by the way, that's in Romans 3. It is the moral law that is getting established. That, that, is, that God will judge everyone by. The moral law, which is part of the Ten Commandments. Right? The moral law. Look what he says. The fourth commandment, are authoritative. What do I mean by that? Look what he says here. Look what he says as an example. Honor your father and mother. Where is that? What commandment is this? Hey? Five. Five. Yeah? Now pay attention to this. This is important. Which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may be well with you that you may live long on earth what is he appealing to the fifth of the ten commandments right stay with me the, which is the first commandment with a promise no you're wrong Paul because the first commandment to the church after the church was established was Peter when he said to the uh, Jews at that time, repent and uh, be baptized and your sins will be forgiven. That's the first commandment if you're really looking at the New Testament. That came with a promise. And no, Paul, you're wrong too, because the first commandment given in the Old, Old Testament with a promise, you can say when God said to Adam, if you eat of that tree, you, I promise you, you will die. I say, ah, oh, but that's a negative promise. Positive promise. Positive promise is when God said to Abraham, go to the land that you don't know, and I will, I will, I will. That's a command. That's the first command with a promise. What command are you appealing to that is so authoritative with a promise? First of what? First of which commandments? The Ten Commandments. And if that's the first with a promise, then he's actually looked at the first, the, the first of the Ten Commandments. That's not the first one with a promise. That's not the second one. Therefore, ye can, ye, you have to resist and actively suppress the fact that the first and the second and the third and the fourth commandment are not authoritative for you to say yes that's true we abide by this but we don't abide with the by the others that is absurd he's focusing here he's fully focusing when he said the first commandment with a promise he's actually having in his mind the authoritative 10 commandments the 10 commandments are authoritative just process this in mind think about it and i'm happy to answer your questions if you come up with any later but for now let's move on there are more about the ten commandments i'm going just deeper and deeper into the ten commandments did you know that the ten commandments are 
are the only commandments really spoken directly by God. And it is not just the last six that were spoken directly by God and the first four, well, you know, that's okay. <laughs> no, the, first, the old commandments spoken by then God spoke all these words. That's in Exodus 21. Look at Deuteronomy 5.22. These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain from the midst of the fire, of the cloud and of the thick gloom with a great voice. And he added no more. He wrote them on the tablets of stone and gave them to, to me. God would speak to Israelites normally through whom? Prophets. And in that, in that time, who did he use to speak through? Moses. Right? Moses to Aaron and Aaron to the Israelites. This is the norm. This is the pattern. And then God comes and he says, no, I will not let you say these words. I will say it to all of them directly. We're still building up. We're still building up. Did you know this is, these are the only commandments, obviously, written on stones, tablets of stone, on stones. Now the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and remain there. I will give you the stone of tablets with the law, the law, and the commandments which I have written for their instructions. They're written on stones. I'll come back to this in a minute. Did you know that these are the only commandments, the only commandments that God written with his finger? When he had finished speaking with him upon Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written by the finger of God. Steve Job is not the first one to come up with a tablet where you write with your finger, by the way. <laughs> God did. God did. God was not satisfied that he said him directly to people as though that is not enough. God brought these stones, not scrolls made out of whatever, papyrus, or he came up with stones, rock solid stuff. And then when he wrote, he did not write with something that can be rubbed away. He wrote it with what? His finger. And by the way, you know what happened to the story when the tablet, when Moses carried the tablet, and then later on, he smashed it in the ground. He went back to God, and guess what God did? Wrote her again with his finger. And settled. Not only is it written by God's finger, <clears throat> and God spoke it directly, but God actually says about it, the tablets were God's work. And the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. It's God's work. It's like a piece of art. Wow. God's work. I actually loved it when I read this today. But man, and I started researching what is the significance of it being called God's work. The tablets were God's work. Not just a couple of tablets and then God wrote on it, but it's his masterpiece. Precious to him. Why do you think it's God's work? Divine, okay. Why? Why do you think the scripture calls it God's work? And we'll finish with this today. Why is it that it's God's work? 
that God says this is a masterpiece. So good that I made sure it's on stone. And not just stone, but I made sure I'm the one who writes it. And when God writes something, it's very good handwriting. Not like mine. Why? And once God writes it, you, you know it's going to stay. Yep. Dude, the Ten Commandments reveal the character of God. They do. They reveal the character of God. That's why it's God's work. It's precious to God. Because they reveal to us who God is and what God does. This is a big, chunky part. This is the first four commandments. <clears throat> and let's read it with an open mind and see how all the commandments in those Ten Commandments together reveal to us who God is. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. No idol. Okay? Only me and no idol. You shall not worship them or serve them for, look at this. Look how these commandments are rooted in who God is. For Yahweh your God am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and on the fourth generations of those who hate me. By showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Why is it that we must never ever have an idol or a statue of any sort, whether in heaven or on earth or under earth? Why is it that we must never do that? I want to ask you a question. Was God only jealous in the Old Testament, but today in this covenant, He's no longer jealous? Will he ever stop being a jealous God? No. Then this is an effect. Then the first two commandments here so far in effect. So long as God is a jealous God, that's who he is, therefore, we will have no other God before us. This is how we show that we love him. Right? Let's continue. You shall not take the name of Yahweh. By the way, the word name itself, what does that mean? What does it reveal to us when we see the word name? Identity, his character. Okay, so that's just dead giveaway. <laughs> All right. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain. Yahweh will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. The name of God, the scripture says, is holy. Holy is his name. It's a character of God. That's who God is. He is holy. How can I take something so sacred, so holy, of someone that is infinitely lovely, and I drag it through the mud by using it and abusing it? When is it that it's okay for me to take God's name in vain. Never. Why? Because it's rooted in what? In his own name. His own holiness demands that I must always, all the time, honor his name and never take it in vain, right? This is also an aspect of what or, or, or way that I would express that I love God. 
I love him by not worshipping any other God before me. I love him by not having any idol before me. He's a jealous God. But he's also a holy God. So I must never, ever take his name in vain. And he continues on. He says, six days you shall labor. And by the way, we haven't really begun yet hammering that Sabbath. But, but just for now, and we'll finish it with this. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahweh, your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the, blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Wait a second. A couple of things. Remember last week? How did the uh, Pentateuch distinguish between something that is ceremonial and something else that is moral? Remember when we talked about having sex with animals versus eating particular kind of food? What was the distinction? How did we draw the conclusion this is moral and the other one is ceremonial? Yeah. He says this, remember, let me bring it to your attention again. For the food that is, um, you should eat it. He said, you must, you must not eat that particular food, but what can you do? Give it to the sojourners, those strangers, those who pass by, give it to them. No problem, all right? Anybody that passes by and you want to sell it to them, give it to them. But you, you must be holy, therefore you must not eat it. Whereas when he talked about sex with animals, he said, nobody, not you, not the sojourners that are within you, meaning no, not the strangers, not the travelers that come within you, nobody ought to do this. That's the first thing. Look what he says here. The seventh day is Sabbath of Yahweh your God, in it you shall not do any work. You or your son, your daughter, your male, your female, Servant or cattle, or your, your sojourner who stays with you. Right? That's just give away. But not only that, again, going back to revealing the character of God. For in six days, in six days, Yahweh did what? Made the heavens and the earth. So, what's the connection? Between keeping the Sabbath and the reason why we ought to keep the Sabbath? The first two, God says, I'm a jealous God. That's why you got to do what you have to do. Then the next one, because of my name, I'm holy. That's why you got to make sure you don't um, uh, take my name in vain. And in that commandment, he says, you got to do it because I created. I, I did this. The commandments are rooted in God, who God is and what God does. What does this mean? That God made the heaven and earth? By the way, that is set on stone, right? Because you can't go back and change your past. And by the way, he did this not just for the Israelites. He did this for whom? Everyone, right? So it's a universal act of God. It's a universal act of God that is set on stone long before even the Mosaic Covenant was established. Just like his jealousy was set in stone long before the Mosaic Covenant was established. And so on and so forth. All right? What does that mean? We'll talk about it later. Of course, in it we'll see the provision of God. We'll see that God is rest. God is the rest. He is our Sabbath. We're going to talk a lot more about that. But so far... I want to tell you, at least at this point, that the Ten Commandments reveal the character of God. Right? They will look at it through, you look at it really quickly, 
Um, they are, the Ten Commandments are the law of love. The Ten Commandments represent the whole law. The Ten Commandments are written in the heart of the Gentiles. The Ten Commandments are authoritative. The Ten Commandments are the only commandments directly spoken by God. They're the only commandments written in stone by the finger of God, and they are called God's work. And finally, the Ten Commandments reveal the character of God. Why would we dismantle it? Why would we do that? We're going to continue to look at it as what it means. Jesus says, I am the Lord of Sabbath, of the Sabbath. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Right? We're also going to talk about, well, if that's the case, how come we're worshiping on Sunday? Because we are Sunday worshipers. We're not, we're not Saturday worshipers. We are Sunday. We're going to talk a lot of, more about that. Any question? I've got five minutes to answer. Basim. Mike, please. Why are we only taking the second half and not working six days? Why are we what? You're talking about keeping the Sabbath holy. Yeah. But you're ignoring that we have to work six days. What are you? I'm so sorry. You just what does the command me. say? Yeah, but, but we're talking about the, um, uh, the Sabbatarian. We're talking about what is Sabbatarian. We're not talking about, of course, you've got to work on six days. But we're not working six days. We're only working five. Well, how do you define work? Work. So, sorry, what's your point? Like, what are you trying to get at? To justify. <laughs> I, I don't understand. No, no. The purpose here, the purpose here, all right, the purpose here is to see whether the Lord's Day is binding. My purpose in this task is not to talk about whether we ought to work five days, three days, one day. That's another subject of another time. Now we want to focus our attention to know. Is the scripture true? Is it really true that the Sabbath is binding? Is it or is it not? Okay. This is the focus and the scope of, of this series. So I want to make it really clear again. We want to know, is it true that we are to uh, keep one day a week holy? And what does this mean? This is the scope. I'm not, I don't want to drag it and talk about other stuff, maybe another time, another place, but that's the f purpose. Yeah. So six days we work, and the Sabbath day made holy, uh, not to do any work. So does that mean no cooking? We will talk about this <laughs> at cooking the right Saturday time. Saturday for Sunday? The, the implications, we will talk about it at another time. Right now, we want to see whether the Sabbath is binding. Okay, so let's, let's one step at a time. We want to see, is the Sabbath binding? I'm not talking about whether we should work in other days or not. That's, not, that's outside of the scope. Uh, we will be talking later on about, well, what does that mean, implications of it? But what we want to see, is it binding?